All right, good morning everyone. Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist, also a chiropractic physician at Gates Brain Health. And today we're talking about POTS and hormones. So uh, as I start the broadcast, good morning to everyone who's joining. Let me know how the sound is and uh, I'll start rolling from here. Okay, so let me minimize this. We'll go here and we're going to present from the beginning. Okay, <clears throat> so this uh, diagram is from Frontiers and Pediatrics. There's the link. You can go ahead and look at that. Um, basically, this is describing the renin-angiotensin system that I talked about in the POTS autoimmune part two broadcast. It's important for those of you who want to understand why maybe your POTS is worse at different times of the month relative to hormones and maybe your menstrual cycle. Understanding the renin-angiotensin system, at least at a glance, is going to help you. And so um, I think it's important that we just kind of review this physiology before we get into the nitty-gritty of it. Because the basic overview is that throughout the monthly cycle, estrogen and progesterone levels vary. When someone has their menses, for example, and we're just going to be a little gender specific here because 94% of POTS patients are females and doesn't mean it can't happen in males. It does. Um, concussions we're finding is a huge uh, source of POTS, but relative to most POTS sufferers, uh, they do see a correlation between the time of the month, so to speak, and their symptoms. So around menses, that is when, or let's say right before you go into menses, or right before a person goes into menses, estrogen levels are at their lowest, whereas progesterone levels are basically, they've been high right before menses. And then as we approach mid-cycle, so to speak, so that's where you're going to ovulate or a person will ovulate, then Estrogen levels at that point are going to be at their highest, and progesterone levels are going to be at their lowest. So that's important to know. And then also know that when your estrogen levels are low, basically your ability to bring sodium back into your body is going to be lower because aldosterone is going to be lower. And we'll talk about that in a second. So in essence, fluid volume tends to be the greatest, and fluid volume is important for POTS patients because POTS patients have a tendency for their fluid volume to be down in their legs and not getting back up to their heart, not getting up to their brain for the reasons I outlined in the autoimmune broadcast because all those communications between the brain and the nervous system, um, those neurological links, so to speak, to get the blood back up to your heart and your brain are not working because of autoimmunity to basically adrenaline or acetylcholine receptors, potentially neuropathy, but that's even under question now because so much of it seems to be an autoimmune neuropathy, so to speak, or an autoimmune autonomic neuropathy. So, excuse me one second. I got a click in my ear. So, with that being said, this is diagramming the renin angiotensin system. So, as I mentioned the other night, so if, if you were to cut my arm and I was bleeding out and blood was spurting out of my arm, my body is going to go into high alert. I need to enact mechanisms to try and save my life. So without having to think about it, our kidney is going to sense that there's less blood coming through it. So that's right down here where you see renal perfusion is lower. And then the renal perfusion being lower is important because that is going to trigger this thing called renin. Renin is going to go to your liver and basically cause a conversion of angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. Hopefully all of you are with me. Then angiotensin 1 is largely converted in the lungs because that's where this angiotensin converting enzyme is located. And so ACE, so to speak here, you've heard of ACE inhibitors. Those are involved with blood pressure regulation. They're medications. So ACE is going to convert angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 is really important for then going back to the kidney and telling or rather the adrenal gland, telling the adrenal gland to produce more aldosterone. Aldosterone has the primary effect in the kidney of saving sodium and getting rid of potassium. 
So aldosterone saves sodium and gets rid of potassium. So if you basically don't have enough aldosterone, then you're not going to save sodium at the right rate. If you don't save sodium, then what happens? Your blood volume goes down. What is one of the measures that probably a lot of people have talked to you about? Increase your salt. So basically that is what we want to focus on at this point. I just want to go to the live and say good morning to everybody who's joined. Happy Saturday morning. Okay, let's get back to it. Uh, let me see here. I'll minimize this. And we're back to presenting. Okay, and you guys can see me. Huh. It looks like this diagram's in the center. I didn't mean for it to be that way. That's weird. It should be off to the right-hand side. Ha, 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 ha. Is that any better? It's not. Well, I'm sorry that my face is in front of the diagram, everyone. I tried to have that correct, but we'll work on that this next week. Okay. So, carrying on, now we know that Aldosterone helps us to retain fluid volume. The angiotensin II does a number of other things, like increasing sympathetic activity. It's working at the level of the kidney for you know saving sodium and and even reabsorption of some potassium. So there's a lot of different effects of aldosterone. It's going to cause some vasoconstriction of your arteries. It's going to tell your pituitary gland basically to affect ADH secretion, which is antidiuretic hormone. So you save more water. So the whole system is working together to maintain your fluid volume. But understanding that basically aldosterone, what it does in terms of saving sodium and getting rid of potassium is really important because aldosterone levels change based on estrogen. And estrogen levels change throughout the menstrual cycle. So this is probably the best article published that I could find on this. Um, there's been nine articles published regarding POTS and estrogen, basically. So if you search POTS and estrogen, you'll find nine articles. Um, and this article, I believe this was published in 2017. It's a comparison to an article in 2010. And so you have some good authors from here. Um, you have these individuals who are from Texas, and you have another author from Harvard. And so they're talking about POTS patients and how POTS patients see variations in their symptoms depending on the time of the menstrual cycle. So here you can see it's very, it's pretty clear cut. If you just take a breath, just look at this diagram. And basically the black dots represent mid luteal phase. So this is when estrogen levels are their highest, the black dots. The EFP represents early follicular phase. So that is more around the time, like right after menses. And so estrogen levels are going to be lower then. And you can see here that systolic blood pressure, that's what SBP is. SBP for these patients is much higher, and these are POTS patients, than during the earlier early follicular phase. So you can see there's a difference and blood pressure for POTS patients around the time of ovulation versus around the time of menses. Whereas for controls, it's not that different. So what we're seeing is an accentuation in POTS patients that isn't there in controls. Now the physiology is there in controls, but, but basically normal people who don't have POTS are gonna be able to auto-regulate their blood pressure independent of what their hormones are doing much better than a POTS patient. Why? Because a POTS patient has autoimmunity to adrenaline and possibly uh, acetylcholine receptors, so they're not sending the right signals down to their low extremities and others of their body to get the blood back up to the brain. So that's pretty noteworthy. Uh, let me see here. Mm, let me see, what was this one? And then here you can see PRA stands for plasma renin activity. If I go back up to here, remember, if we see decreased blood going through the kidney, then the body is going to produce renin, which goes to your liver and causes angiotensinogen to become angiotensin 1. So renin goes up when blood going through the kidney is less. So here you can see in the POTS patients, their plasma renin activity is very different 
that's the black dot when they're ovulating, versus around the time of menstruation. Whereas for controls, there is a little difference, but you can see it's not nearly as great or quite as dramatic as it is with POTS patients. So the POTS patients have a dramatic difference. Controls have a very subtle difference. So pretty interesting information. And their conclusion was these results suggest that the menstrual cycle modulates the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system and affects hemodynamics during orthostasis and POTS. The high estrogen and progesterone in the mid-luteal phase, i.e. ovulation, are associated with greater increases in renal adrenal hormones and presumably more fluid volume, which improve late standing tolerance in these patients. So this is why you may be better around ovulation than you will be around menses. And this is just another article from Frontiers in Neuroscience, a little more recent, talking about pubertal, pubertal hormones, <clears throat> so to speak. So around the time of puberty, uh, and how it seems that POTS comes on around that time. So their pot postulate is that basically as the body is kicking into gear all these hormones during puberty, which is why we tend to grow so much. We have all these, you know, uh, changes in our hair and we get acne and things like that is because basically that causes the POTS or predisposes the POTS to come on or come about. But again, POTS lots of times is triggered by a viral illness. It's not uncommon for mononucleosis or Epstein-Barr to trigger POTS. It could be another viral illness, and it may be those viral illnesses in conjunction with a lot of hormones floating around that then seems to predispose people for POTS to come out. You can see here right around the age of 14, 15, that seems to be the time where POTS becomes or has a great chance of happening. But anyways, POTS can happen at any point in the life. Um, so, but it tends to be younger women, you know, younger to middle-aged women. I think in the article I presented on Wednesday, they said like 29 was the average mass or menace about 11 years. So anyways, uh, so they're saying that pubertal hormones play a role in predisposing females to not VVS as vasovagal syncope and POTS. So yeah. So hopefully this makes sense. So if you've been suffering with POTS and you're just not sure why, um, and maybe the POTS is good at times and not good at times, think of your, your hormonal cycle and what that is doing. And oh, and then here we have a comment that POTS started when menopause hit after hysterectomy, which is very interesting. Uh, and that's a great question. So did I find any articles on POTS and menopause? I did not relative to my search on POTS and estrogen, but let me dig into <clears throat> POTS and menopause. So I will get back to you on that comment and thank you so much. But it does make sense. Basically any hormonal, as we call them, perturbations definitely can predispose someone to having dysregulations of fluid volume. So uh, I'll have to dig into that, but very, very, very interesting. So thank you all for the kind comments, and I hope you have a wonderful Labor Day weekend. Uh, let me know any thoughts or questions you have. And, um, you know, I also need to probably do a broadcast on how estrogen affects the thyroid, because that was another question that came up this week, which was really interesting, um, because there seems to be this overlap between POTS and autoimmunity, clearly, like we talked about. And one of the first ways they started noticing that was that a large percentage of POTS patients had, as I mentioned, anti-nuclear antibodies. They had Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And so then that raises the question, well, if estrogen by itself can affect aldosterone levels, what is estrogen doing for other autoimmune disorders? And lupus and Hashimoto's have a strong female preponderance. And what we do find with Hashimoto's is that the estrogen seems to predispose an individual to autoimmunity to the thyroid. So um, that may be playing a role also. And many of you have been on birth control medications or maybe you're taking estrogen derivatives in the menopausal phase. And, and what is that doing to your, your immune system? Those are the key questions. So I probably need to circle back and do a broadcast on that also. So. Anyways, hope you all have a great weekend, and I will see you next week. Okay, bye.